Coming up on Market to Market. Political foes slap a tariff on major trade deals. Farm laborers in the world's sixth largest economy are in line for overtime. And a CSA uses customized orders to drive sales growth. Those stories and market analysis with John Roach, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, September 2 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Creating jobs and a stronger economy are becoming a chicken or egg debate. Hope for future growth is increasing in some circles, while unemployment opportunities remain elusive. For the third straight month, the unemployment rate held steady at 4.9 percent. However, a tepid 151,000 jobs were created in August as the number of people applying for work fell back. Creighton's Business Conditions Index rose to 47.8 last month. The measure of the rural economy remains below growth neutral due to pessimism about the near-term economy in the nine state surveys. And optimism about the nation's economic future pushed the Consumer Confidence Index to an 11-month high. Some of that economic optimism is being fueled by trade deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Despite U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman's signature on the treaty, a political blockade is still in place at home. Peter Tubbs reports. Like milk past its expiration date, the already fading prospects for two trade agreements continued to sour this week. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell stated that a vote to authorize the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, will not be held when Congress returns after the November elections. And the current agreement, the the Trans-Pacific Agreement, which has some serious flaws, will not be acted upon this year, but it will still be around. It can be a massage, change, worked on uh, during the next administration. Opinions on trade agreements on the other side of the Atlantic are no better. <laughs> German Vice Chancellor Sigmar Gabriel dismissed the prospects for the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, between the United States and the European Union. In my opinion, the talks with the United States have de facto failed, even though nobody really admits that. Negotiations on TTIP required 14 rounds of talks over three years, yet none of the problems in the 27 chapters of the treaty being discussed were resolved. A similar treaty between Canada and the EU has been ratified, But U.S. negotiators worry that provisions in that treaty set a bad precedent for TTIP and future agreements. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. With a gross domestic product of $2.5 trillion, California recently bumped France from its economic perch to become the world's sixth largest economy. Helping propel that economy to its lofty position are the entertainment, technology, and agriculture sectors. But how city folk and farmhands have gotten paid in this environment has always been a little different. That was until the Golden State's legislature changed the game. Paul Yeager reports. Workers inside the nation's top agricultural state are in line for more overtime pay under a bill passed this week. On Monday, lawmakers in Sacramento sent legislation to Governor Jerry Brown mandating overtime pay after eight hours in a day or 40 hours in a week. Under current law, California employers must pay time and a half to farm laborers after they work 10 hours in a day or 60 hours in a week. 
Today, colleagues, we have the opportunity here in California to erase the inequality of our agricultural overtime laws that was born out of shameful racism. California's bill is the first of its kind and would end the 80-year-old exemption field hands have from wage rules. Farms with fewer than 25 workers would have six years to begin the rate change, double the time period for larger operations. Business groups like the California Farm Bureau Federation said the provisions will further burden owners dealing with the ongoing water crisis and expanded regulations. The Western Growers Association called the bill short-sighted policy. Other opponents, mostly Republican legislators, cited farm work that is inherently seasonal and shouldn't be subjected to the same rules as traditional labor. The United Farm Workers are backing the legislation. However, some supporters contend the OT pay will prompt bosses to hire more workers to avoid doling out the extra income. Many have talked about tearing out labor-intensive crops. I spoke with a table grape grower in the county and said, if this bill were to pass and be signed into law, that they will pull out all the table grapes, they will plant crops like carrots that can be harvested and packaged by machines. Most farmers have yet to be sold on the plan, but workers believe threats to leave the Golden State are muted because, as one farm laborer put it, they can't take the dirt with them. An estimated 829,000 people work on California farms, many going beyond harvesting fruits and vegetables. Those employed by dairies and livestock facilities, along with irrigators and equipment operators, stand to benefit the most as much of the seasonal harvesting force picks for less than eight hours a day. Governor Brown has yet to indicate if he'll sign the landmark legislation. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council, the components of the average American meal travel about 1,500 miles from farm gate to dinner plate. There have always been exceptions to that rule. For the past 30 years, small farm operators have managed community-supported agriculture groups, or CSAs, trying to keep local food close to home. However, as Peter Tubbs found out, one CSA is turning that idea on its head in order to make a profit. It's packing day for Bella Bean Organics, a CSA near Durham, North Carolina. A few of the delivery boxes have the standard collection of spring vegetables and strawberries. Some may get a custom order of vegetables, ensuring the household only purchases what they will eat. But most contain items not normally seen in a CSA box. Bread, meat, eggs, pasta. Bella Bean Organics is a progressive CSA. By sourcing produce from multiple farms in the Raleigh-Durham, North Carolina region to supplement what they grow on their own farm, Bella Bean can deliver produce consistently. You know, if I'm going to go to the trouble and order all this stuff from one farm and, and they have a beet failure, well, then I don't get beets that year, but the farm next door might have had beets. So the concept of sort of a, an in-between person that, uh, like a food hub, I think is what we're tending to call them now, would gather stuff from multiple farmers and do that as a CSA. That's better for the consumer in the sense that the box really is full of stuff, even if one farmer or two farmers has a, a, a bad crop on something. Acting as a food hub extends the reach of producers. Farmers markets locally are all producer only, which means you have to have grown it or made it yourself to be at that farmers market to sell it. Well, unless you've got a dozen kids, you can only attend one or two markets. Providing another distribution channel increases the volume of produce that farmers can sell, improving profitability. Producers also can focus on the crops that do well on their land, rather than planting a varied produce menu to fulfill their own CSA clientele. Technology drives Bella Bean's unique service. While their standard weekly vegetable CSA will deliver whatever is in season, a custom vegetable order can be adjusted to the tastes of the member household. As a result, custom orders are 75% of Bella Bean's business. Custom customers snap up value-added products like meat and seafood, as well as higher margin items including baked goods, pasta, pickles, and chocolates made by local entrepreneurs. Pasta maker Carmela Alvaro produces small batch pasta in her converted garage in Durham, North Carolina. 
She leverages regional flavors to create local favorites, like pimento cheese ravioli, to separate her products from mass market brands. A company like Bella Bean um, will bring together uh, local products from um, a bunch of different companies that really complement the produce and the meats they have from their own farm, which I think is a unique model. So our pasta is a great complement to their produce and to their meats. The wide array of products on the Bella Bean menu helps customers conserve their most valuable resource, time. Rather than traveling to multiple farmers markets each week, the selected items land on the doorstep after each order is filled. The Raleigh-Durham Triangle region is wealthy and food sophisticated, which creates a range of customer expectations. High quality retail options in the region raise the bar for all the producers tapped by the innovative CSA for supply. I'd say expectations have gone up a lot. A lot of the Bella Bean customers are people who either have shopped at Whole Foods or do shop at Whole Foods or, or stores like that, and they're, they're really used to seeing pretty produce. And perfect. Perfect per, yeah, produce. Perfect. And perfect packaging and little bows tied. And, 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 when, and farm customers are, you know, farm customers are very forgiven. You know, uh, they're, they, they come and they're so happy to be able to participate in the farm experience that, you know, they don't care if there's a little bug hole in their kale. You Just know, proves that it's organic. They're, yeah, they're kind of open to it. But um, Bella Bean customers have very high standards, and they want their packaging perfect, and they want it, you know, they want it to look like it just came from Whole Foods. On packing day, products flow in at a steady rate. Non-perishable vegetables will be delivered in standard produce boxes, while temperature-sensitive goods are protected with insulation and cold packs. Foam shipping containers and second-day delivery services allow Bella Bean to extend their delivery map outside of the Raleigh-Durham Triangle to almost anywhere in the lower 48 states. The broad range of products has built a national customer base of households that lack local access to organic produce and meat raised without antibiotics. And we have Bella customers who you can tell are sitting down to do their shopping for the month. I mean, they're placing a $350 order and they are stocking up on everything. Managing growth is tricky business. While the value of the average Bella Bean box has tripled in seven years to over $80 a box, coordinating grower production with consumer demand is a balancing act. You know, there's the whole supply demand curve and you know, if one gets ahead of the other, then people are unhappy. By delivering to a customer's doorstep the equivalent of a dozen farmer's markets, food aggregators like Bella Bean are broadening the definition of both community and agriculture in CSA. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Next, the Market to Market Report. There was plenty of volatility in the commodity markets as funds covered their short sales on the lows. Even with prices rebounding in the final two sessions, the trade finished mixed. For the week, December wheat fell eight cents, while the nearby corn contract gained three cents. The prospect of a record large crop and favorable weather continued to put pressure on soybean prices as the November contract lost 15 cents. October meal went along for the ride, dropping 870 per ton. In the softs, December cotton continued its downward spiral, losing 24 cents. Over in the dairy parlor, October Class 3 milk futures gained 35 cents. Prices in the livestock sector continued to move downward as the October cattle contract gave up 865, October feeders shed 388, and the October lean hog contract fell $1.18. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index rose 29 points. Crude oil dropped 320 per barrel. Gold lost almost all of last week's gains, losing 1950 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index was down nearly 18 points to finish the week at 346.90. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is our senior market analyst, John Roach. John, welcome back. Great to be here, Mike. Last week, Darren Newsom was on, and he painted a, a bare picture looking out to the future. And as we talk about this wheat market, we've got tremendously low prices. When does the demand kick in? 
Demand has already kicked in. It's not a matter of, of not having demand. Uh, we just have big supplies. Uh, but we're putting it on fire sale. And we have to think in terms of, of discounting prices, moving it out, and, uh, and moving on into the next year. The one, the one positive thing in the wheat market is the protein levels around the world are very uh, low. And so high-protein wheat is going to carry premium uh, to, uh, to n normal qualities. So hopefully we'll fire sell it and then be able to move forward into this next 2017 year with maybe a, a little better outlook. Well, the outlook is going to be better because acreage are going to be reduced. We saw some acreage uh, uh, reports out or estimates of uh, planted acreage for the new year in its smallest acreage since 1970. So uh, uh, we're going to continue to cut uh, the planted acres and uh, uh, and we'll continue to, uh, to move the demand up and, and we'll get the product moved away. All right. One of the bright spots this week in the commodity markets was the corn market. Finished the week up. We bounced off that 2014 low. What does that tell you going into the future? Well, I'm not sure one uh, one day or two days does a trend make, uh, but uh, but I think we bottomed the market this week. We had enough things coming to the intersection of time uh, with the old crop inventory needing to get moved. There were quite a few delayed price contracts and other kind of pricing mechanisms that had an August 31 deadline, and they flushed through the system. There were a lot of elevators that had their biggest daily buy in a long time just uh, as those bushes were finally forfeited into the market. Uh, we also have people cleaning out their bin and we have people looking at the big numbers and we've already discounted prices with a speculative selling. So all those things coming together, uh, I believe, put a bottom in the corn market. As I look out forward, I think the demand starts to crank and I think that the, the growers, farmers, will be very reluctant to sell new crop as they're harvesting it. The prices are too cheap, they'll figure out a way to put it away and I think that the market will rebound uh, here actually in prior to harvest, and then I think that uh, we have further rebounds after harvest. On the demand side, this idea that Brazil is going to need our corn, is that something that, that gets you excited? It does. Uh, more importantly, they're not going to sell their corn in competition to us. Uh, if you look at the, the corn pricing around the world, our corn is the cheapest corn right now. So uh, the market is coming to our doorstep, and, and as we look out forward, we're going to have more of that as we move from now into the new year. All right. We've got a question here from one of our Twitter followers. This is from Farmer Alyssa, and she wants to know how far below estimates would harvest numbers have to be to spark a rally before the end of the year, specifically in the bean market. Do we need much below expectations to get a rally going? Well, it would, it would certainly help. But remember, the, the supplies are relatively tight on soybeans until the Brazilian harvest, the new harvest that will start in about January. So we really have a period of time where we're really the only market in town. The Brazilians still have a little more of their last year crop to get exported, but maybe another four or five weeks worth of, worth, worth of sizable exports, and then they're going to be relatively done. And so we think that as, as the U.S. Uh, uh, harvest comes underway, we'll be about the only store in town, and we think that the, the demand will continue to be brisk, and we think, again, farmers are going to be hard to deal with. Uh, trying to, to make money on the farm uh, is hard if you're selling at these kind of price levels. So to that end, as farmers are storing corn in anticipation of that rally and perhaps selling soybeans to not pay that storage, should they look to reown as the combines are running in the soybean market? I wouldn't want to sell inventory this harvest and lose control of it. Okay. Uh, what I'd rather do is I'd rather see a, a grower move the inventory into Chicago. In other words, just keep the inventory, just put it in a different location. Because I think between now and the first of the year, any little weather problem down in Brazil is going to be amplified through our market. So that's really the next place to look for, for strength in the bean market. Not so much because the U.S. crop is smaller or something like that, but instead because our competition doesn't have any supply. Right. And they have to have a big crop this next year. You bet. Let's take a look at the livestock market. It's uh, live cattle down $8. Every time we get ready to call a bottom, we seem to fall right through it. John Roach, are we getting close? Well, people were calling a bottom this week until we got another bad day in the futures market again. So uh, we think the market will have a, a recovery, and, and we think it's just right around the corner if it's not right here. So, uh, so we believe prices are down on the bottom side, and, and uh, uh, you know, but we, we've got to continue to keep cattle moving. We can't let them get heavy and, uh, uh, and, and get move. Hopefully we have good clearance here over the Labor Day weekend. That's going to be the real key to the cattle market here this next week. Got to see if we can get 
the consumer out there buying the supplies that are there today. We need the demand to show up at the grocery store this weekend. Okay. Feeder cattle, same story. We continue to break. Finally, maybe corn's found a bottom. Does that, to you, spell some future weakness in feeder cattle? Well, I think the, the, the biggest problem the feeder cattle market has, there's a couple of them. First of all, pasture conditions are very good. The good to excellent uh, pasture, 53% of the country is rated, the pasture is rated good to excellent, and that's, that's up almost 20% above normal. So we have good pasture conditions, which will tend to keep the, the feeders there a little bit. Uh, but on the flip side of it, you have the, the, the fat cattle uh, producer, the, the feeder, the people feeding the cattle, uh, really suffering uh, some, some horrible losses. I mean, at the Farm Progress show this week, we heard horrible losses uh, that were being taken by cattle feeders. So cattle feeders are looking for another notch down in feeder cattle prices. So either the fat cattle will start to rally quickly or the feeder cattle are going to take another notch lower. All right. As you look out for the next couple of years, do you anticipate that feeder cattle market to continue to drop as supplies grow? Well, the actual uh, slaughter mix now is starting to show more heifers in the feedlot. We're seeing more cows in the slaughter mix. And so we think maybe the expansion is going to slow a little bit here, uh, although the numbers will be probably be bigger in January. We think that the, the expansion will, will be held in check here a little bit uh, because of the, of the profitability situation. All right. Well, now let's look at this lean hog market. John Roach, the question that we seem to get asked almost every single week is, is it safe to buy lean hogs yet? Do you think we've found a bottom here that will hold in this lean hog market as we go to the future? Not yet. Um, the, the problem we have in the hog business is that the hogs gain better when we start to see new corn coming into the, into the feed ration. And, and so we've already had the weights inch up here during hot weather, which is really unusual. And we anticipate that we're going to be uh, seeing weights come up some more as the weather cools and we have new crop corn. So we think the hog market's still on a tough sled. Okay. Now, John, you've hit on a couple of things that I'd like to circle back to. You presented a fairly, a fairly bullish picture as we look at wheat, corn, and beans. So if I'm an end user, a feeder, ethanol plant, how far out should I be locking in my supplies for fourth quarter or 2017? I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully not presenting a bullish picture because I don't really have a bullish picture for these markets. I have a better picture. I have a, I have a, 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 a reason to expect some strength following harvest and maybe even a little strength going into harvest okay. here. But from a standpoint of the, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, I lost track of the question. End My, users. End users. When should we be, okay. how long should we be buying coverage? <laughs> I think you have to extend out a whole year. I mean, I think if you, if you look at the prices, you're at seven year lows or 10 year lows, depending on what you're looking at. These are, these are prices that you just have to own. You have to, you have to get your needs covered. And that's what I think uh, helps our markets as we come into harvest. Users will want to get a lot of coverage on when the grower really doesn't want to sell very much. And so I think the two of them, when they come together, the, the user will be willing to bid up rather than not get coverage. Because you can bid up and still be at a discount over the past 10, 15 years worth of prices. Absolutely. And the, and the last thing a user will want to do is to miss getting things bought this harvest. You bet. Now, John Roach, final question. As you look out at the global situation, <laughs> is the dollar going to strengthen or weaken as we roll into the fourth quarter of 2016? Well, it's strengthened here as, as, as recently. Um, you know, we're looking at what the Fed's going to do. Are they going to raise the interest rates or not raise the interest rate. And then we're looking at the election and we don't know for sure how that's going to impact it. So, uh, but in general, the, the U.S. economy is percolating along. Okay. Nothing really strong, but a little higher dollar, I'm afraid. All right. Well, thank you so much, John Roach. Thank you very much, Mike. That wraps up our broadcast portion of Market to Market, but John and I will keep the market conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, available on our website. For some market-to-market -market member stations, this is Pledge Week. If you believe in a service that brings you news and in-depth market analysis every week, take a moment to help support this program, public television program. And join us again next week when we explore the prospects for transforming the land of 10,000 lakes in the search for new resources. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. 
Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. <laughs>